Hey guys, how are you doing? As promised, I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that you all had about special and general relativity. Um, I'm going to be totally upfront with you from the beginning and as we go through. There are lots of your questions I don't know the answers to. I, I think the answers are known, I just don't know what the answers are. We're getting into the very edges of physics, um, which is a really exciting place to be learning about, but also the kind of place where you all could ultimately do this research and answer some of these questions yourself. There are some questions that you had that I think I can answer, and I can answer reasonably correctly and reasonably well. A lot of you were confused about four-dimensional space-time, and that's a really good thing to be confused about. Almost anything that you have questions about, there's probably a YouTube video that shows you answers with like nice diagrams and animations and things, um, but I'm going to try to explain some of it too. We think about things existing in three dimensions, right? Like they've all got a length and a width and a height. And they have to exist in three dimensions, otherwise we can't see them. If you actually had something that was truly two-dimensional, it would just be a sheet. And that sheet would be so thin that you couldn't see it because it didn't exist in the third dimension. The same thing is true with time. We can only see this block of post-it notes because it exists in time. If it didn't have a, a, an existence in a length of time, it wouldn't exist and we couldn't detect it. So it has to not only have a length and a width and a height, but also a duration in order for it to be a physical object in our world. So maybe that helps a little bit. And there are lots of ways that mathematically it makes sense to model everything around us with four variables. Maybe that's the best way to think about it. An X, Y, Z, and T coordinate that tells us for sure where an object is and when. And some of the, the exciting stuff about Einstein's results, especially about general relativity, was that it implied that, that that T variable is not as separate from the X, Y, and Z as we perceive it to be. I think maybe in part because we only move forward in that on that T axis. In every other axis, we can move in both directions. But in the T axis, we can only move forward. Maybe that's why we only perceive it to be, we perceive it to be so different. I don't know. We're getting into pretty theoretical stuff here. And again, I'm, I'm telling you things that I believe to be true, and I hope that I'm not telling you anything false. Um, one of the things that I loved about your questions is that many of them boil down to really, which I adore. I really like the fact that I think maybe you have enough faith in yourself as physics learners that you think you ought to understand this and that someone ought to be able to convince you that it's true. And if that's the case, I have done my job this year. I want you to look at the results of scientific experiments and say, mm, okay, explain that to me again. Um, I should be able to understand this. And if I'm not understanding it, I'm not sure I'm going to trust it quite yet. So let's talk about proofs that the speed of light is constant. We'll talk about proofs that time dilation actually happens. Um, and you know what, honest, yeah, yeah, we'll start there. I'm going to try to start with special relativity questions and then move to general relativity questions. Um, the first proof that the speed of light was constant was called the Michelson-Morley experiment. And it wasn't actually what they were trying to predict. They were trying to prove the existence of a lumin luminiferous ether. I think that's how you say the first part of that, which was this substance that, that permeated everything that was the medium light traveled through. When we talked about waves, we talked about how weird it is that light doesn't have a medium, that light can travel through the vacuum of space. Uh, it was believed for a long time that, that light had to have a medium, and the medium was this ether that permeated everything. In an effort to figure out the properties of the ether, whether or not it moved with the Earth, like it was dragged along with the Earth, or whether the Earth turned through it, but either of those could be true. Michelson, and then later Michelson and Morley, did experiments with interferometers. It turns out this is a perfect drawing to have for a later part of our conversation too. So here's the basic idea behind an interferometer. You've got a light source here. You've got a beam splitter here that's gonna send what was the same piece of light or the same light source down two long arms. And then at the end of those two long arms, you're gonna have mirrors. Those mirrors are gonna send the light back and then they're gonna go through the beam splitter again and they're gonna end up at a detector. And you can tell whether or not the light has changed, essentially, by what you get at the detector. And if you want more information about this, let me know, and I'll send you a better link. What Michelson, and Morley, what Michelson found, and then what Michelson and Morley found, was that it didn't matter if these lines were aligned with the motion of the Earth, like aligned along the equator, or perpendicular to the motion of the Earth, say along a line of longitude, the light traveled at the same rate. 
that disproved the luminiferous ether and was one of the first experiments that indicated that the speed of light was constant regardless of your reference frame. The other experiments, there aren't as many experiments that prove the speed of light is constant regardless of reference frame. What there are, are a lot of experiments that prove that time dilation actually happens. <clears throat> I don't know of an experiment that I understand that proves length contraction, but I know two of them that I find compelling when it comes to time dilation. First of all, they took two atomic clocks. Atomic clocks are very, very reliable and they're synchronized with each other. They left one of them on the ground, they put one of them in an airplane, and they flew it around really, really fast for a while, and when they brought it back, its time was slower than the one that had been on the ground. So that right there kind of says it. Because all of these effects happen at the speeds where we travel. They're just so much smaller. Somebody asked, at what speed does, does relativity kick in? It kicks in at every speed. So if you have something moving at one meter a second, which is not very fast at all, relativistic effects are there. They're just so tiny that you couldn't possibly notice them. The other one that I think is really neat. All right, you know that those like subatomic particles, like the, the, the tau neutrinos and the um, bosons and things like that, that we talked about last week, you kind of believe that those exist and that they've been studied. Um, they have been, and their half-lives are known, So, which is how long it takes for half of them to decay. This is the stuff that we learned just last week. But when you create those, you often create them as a result of collision, and or you can accelerate them in a particle accelerator, um, which we talked about just a little bit when we talked about charged particles moving in a magnetic field would turn a particle, and then you can use an electric, uh, an electric field to accelerate a particle. Anyway, you can make things go really, 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 really fast. When you make those short-lived particles go really, really fast, they live longer. Their, their half-lives are longer, are observed to be longer when they're moving faster because time slows down for them. So those two experiments are the ones that convinced me that this was true. Um, yeah, all right. So the other big question that always comes up with time dilation is, so does this mean we can time travel? And so far, the answer seems to be no. We are time traveling, right? We are currently, all of us, moving forward in time at the rate of one day per day. Um, you can slow down your rate of travel through time by speeding up, by going really fast, also by changing where you are gravitationally, um, but you can't speed it up. You can't go, you can't make your, your experience of time go faster, and all that happens is when you get back, you miss stuff. So you can't really travel backwards through time. If you travel 25 light years away and look back at the earth, then the light that is reaching you was 25 years old. So in that sense, I guess you can almost see backwards in time, um, but I'm not sure how useful that would be for you. All right, um, general relativity, some of those uh, experiments are kind of the same. The famous experiment that demonstrated general relativity. So the idea behind general relativity is that, or one of the ideas, is that space-time is curved by massive objects and that things, the paths of things change as they go near a massive object. One of the things whose path should change is light. Light should change its path when it goes past a massive object. So the idea is that if we know where some stars are, I'm going to leave this picture here because we're going to need it later. All right, so here's a bunch of stars. They make a constellation. It looks sort of like an infinity sign. Sure, whatever, right? Stars exist. And we see those stars. Well, when, this is, this is us here on the Earth, if something massive, say our sun, were between us and those stars, it should curve the path of the light that comes from the stars so that we would see these stars in slightly different places. What's the problem with observing those stars that are at while, while the sun is between us and them. Yeah, got it in one. It's daytime and we can't see anything. Except every once in a while, what does our moon do? Our moon gets in the way of the light from the sun, which is basically a solar eclipse when the moon blocks the sun's light from reaching the earth. Well, when the moon is blocking the sun's light, we can see the stars beyond the sun. So this is the famous experiment that was done during an eclipse and showed that the positions of those stars had changed by exactly the amount that was expected. So when the same sky essentially was observed during the eclipse, they saw the positions of the stars differently because the light bent as it went around the sun. All right, pretty nifty. Okay, um, the other question that people had about was about the train um, about this idea of that you sense a force pulling you backwards. That train analogy may make the most sense if you think of the train as being empty and really slippery. 
So if you were standing on like an ice rink in a train and the train went forward, you would fly backwards, right? There's nothing to hold you. In fact, there would have to be a force to move you forward. Anytime there seems to be a force, but we can't find an agent, the answer is usually inertia. So inertia is a body's, an object's property to stay at rest unless a force acts on it. So your body isn't going anywhere unless a force accelerates it. So the train is accelerating forward. You're just trying to stay still. It feels like a backward force, but it's not. It's just your desire not to move. All right. Last thing on my list to talk about is LIGO, um, is the detection of the gravity waves. And the reason I've left this picture here is that the experimental setup is kind of the same as Michelson-Morley, except at LIGO in Livingston and in Hanford, these, wall, these arms are four kilometers long four kilometer long arms in both directions where this light is split, goes down to the end, bounces back, and then is detected. This is how this device can be so sensitive to detect the tiny, tiny, tiny changes in gravitational waves. And the reason we have, and of course it detects all sorts of other stuff too, right? Um, if a truck goes by, LIGO is going to detect it. That's why it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere so that there are fewer of those disruptions. That's also why we had to have two of them. Because the one in Livingston and the one in Hanover, if they detect the same thing at, a, at almost exactly the same time, then that tells us it wasn't a local disturbance. Because there's no way that a truck in Louisiana is causing the one in Washington to have the same disruption. So that's the basic idea. I'll post a nice video um, that shows more about how this works. Um, somebody asked if other things have been discovered. Yeah, um, it's we are getting tons of gravitational wave information I think at least, okay, I have been to LIGO in Livingston a couple of times, and my impression from visiting there is that basically every time they turn this on, they collect data, which means that gravitational wave information is probably coming to the planet all the time, like maybe not daily, but at least weekly. And honestly, the more sensitive the detector gets, the smaller events that can be determined. Um, it's almost just like a new kind of telescope. So the first telescopes were visible light, what you could see with your eyes. We also have infrared telescopes that see things in, the, in that range of the spectrum, ultraviolet telescopes that detect things in that range of the spectrum. And some of the, the people at LIGO talk about these interferometers as being able to just be a different kind of telescope, um, that you can detect all sorts of things that just that create different signals, which I think is super neat. All right, um, there's no way that I have answered all of your questions. Um, if I missed a question, either I thought I answered it um, or I don't know the answer. Um, if you want more information, let me know and I will try to teach you stuff or I will try to learn stuff to teach you stuff and find you resources. Um, you're also going to have a video today about quantum mechanics, which is at least as wacky as relativity, maybe more. That's the last thing that's sort of part, well, you, the seniors will have a small assignment for tomorrow. You'll see that in the morning. Um, juniors, if you guys want to talk more about this stuff next week, um, we absolutely can. Maybe I'll pop you guys a survey up on Monday if you don't want to just be done. Um, or just send me a message if you want to do more of this. Um, it's been a weird year, but it's been a great year. Um, and I hope to see you guys around.